हेलो सर इसमें स्क्रीन विजिबल सर Good morning, Govind. Uh, you can start presentation. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. I'll be uh, listening about suture angles in shoulder surgery. So, hello. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Hello. Hello. Oh, go with. I can hear you. I can see the presentation. Going into suture angles. Before the advent of suture angles, we used to attach soft tissues to bone through drilling a, a transosseous uh, tunnel through the bone and uh, uh, threading the sutures through the tunnel, and then attaching the soft tissues, which are ligaments or uh, tendons or whatever, to the bone. So, with, to circumvent that problem, the advent of suture angles was done. And any suture angle is any device that attaches the soft tissues to the proper side, that is at the bone, and maintains its position without loosening or excessive tension until physiological healing is completed to the bone uh, tissue junction. So coming to uh, the design of suture angles, suture angle mainly has three parts as shown in this picture. The uh, bottom one is the anchor, which uh, uh, attaches itself to the bone. That's the anchor bone. That's the anchor bone junction, and then. Uh, just proximal to that, it has the eyelet. Eyelet is the part through which the suture is threaded and is attached to the anger substance of the suture anger. And then the suture part, that suture part is the one which uh, attaches to the tissue. So you can see there are three junctions, the tissue suture junction, the suture eyelet junction, as well as the eyelet anger junction. So these are three parts of a suture anger, the basic uh, three parts. So initially, the uh, now coming to the uh, evolution of suture angers, initially the suture anger was developed for shoulder surgery. So the first suture anger developed and patented in uh, history was by Gobel and Somers in uh, 1985, called the Static Anger. It's formerly called as the, uh, it's formerly the company is known as Simmer. And uh, it was a metal anger constructed of titanium and was uh, designed to be used in a banger at uh, labral repair in uh, shoulder surgery. So, but the first anger that was reported to be used in the human body was the Mitek G1 anger. Uh, by, uh, bo both were made in the U.S., and uh, this was a nitinol based anger, which was a shape memory effect. Uh, once drilled and put inside the bone, it uh, regains its shape by memory effect and thus giving a purchase onto the bone. So this was the first uh, anger to be used in the human body and it subsequently underwent multiple uh, modification and it's still available in the market. And coming to different types of angers by design. So the first is the uh, screw, uh, difference between screw and impaction type of angers. So screw anger, uh, as you can see on the left side, is typically it typically gets purchased onto the bone by screwing mechanism where you make a pre drill hole, uh, which is corresponding to the core diameter of the screw. And then once you screw in, uh, it, these uh, the threads of the screw displaces bone and gets purchased onto the bone. This is uh, the typical screw in anger that we have. Whereas the interference fit on the, which is seen on the right side, uh, the, the, this uh, holds onto the bone by interference fit and it requires a much larger uh, displacement of bone and the purchase is always better in a screw in suture anger. Next comes the toggling anger. So toggling angers basically works by the principle that the eyelet of the anger, that's at the bottom part you can see, the eyelet of the anger is placed at an angle at different at an angle which is different to the suture material. So when there is an axial pull at the suture material, there will be toggling of the eyelet and the anchor. So within the pre drill hole, it will be inserted. And once there is an axial pull, that is from the rotator cuff, when there is an axial pull to the anchor, it toggles inside the bone and there will be a, a resistance to or a pull out resistance. So the advantage of this type of design is it is even effective in a poor quality bone and in cancellous bone where it is inserted and even though there is not much uh, purchase from the cancellous bone, uh, due to the toggling effect, there will be a uh, pullout strength. Next is the expanding anger. This is an older mechanism, still uh, it is being used. Uh, that is after the insertion of an ang anger into the bone, 
uh, it has a pistol like handle device which is activated and uh, uh, once the pistol like uh, handle device is activated the anger expands inside the bone subcort subcortically and then gets purchased onto the subcortical bone and this gets pull out strength next is the vented suture anger so the vented suture anger the use is that it promotes bone growth inside the uh, anger and there will be no uh, there will be better osseointegration. integration so over a period of time the uh, anger gets uh, incorporated into the bone and uh, the pull out strength is much better next coming to knotless angers so uh, this even even though uh, it has been in design it should be taken with a pinch of salt as always a knotted anger is better over a knotless anger as the knot security when if done properly gives us a better uh, tissue protection and the knotless anger works uh, through the principle that this consists of an anger with a suture sling and a slot on the anger tail aligned with the insertion direction. So the sling is threaded through the soft tissues to be repaired and inserted into the, into a slot on the anger tail. And the anger is driven into the bone while tightening the suture and holding it in tension until it allows the soft tissues to sit, sit snugly onto the bone. So as you can see in this uh, uh, figure, once the uh, uh, suture sling is threaded through the tissue, once it is pulled down and it is... Uh, pushed in with the uh, suture slings held in tension uh, so that the uh, sutures are going to be bound. Next you see is a uh, tack anger. Tack anger is another uh, variant of a uh, knotless anger. In tack angers, it's a type of nail-like device which is stuck into the soft tissue, into the bone, when the, where the soft tissue is intended to, intended to be reattached. So the head of the tack holds the soft tissue to the bone and prevents the nail shaft from slipping through the soft tissue. Uh, also, there is no uh, requirement for a knot or stitching. However, this, uh, there, is, this, there is a difficulty in uh, putting this to practice because the uh, uh, inflex, it is inflexible when the bone under the soft tissue to be repaired is not strong enough. And this is an all suture anger. This, uh, here what happens is the, uh, it, this whole anger is made up of sutures only. And as you can see in this animation, where uh, the part of the sutures itself gets bunched up and acts as an anger. When there is a direct pull of the suture sling, suture thread by the surgeon, the anger deploys inside the subcortical bone and it bunge, bunches up, creating the uh, uh, um, anger within the cortical bone. So this, the use of all suture angles is that the, these come in very small sizes and uh, the polar strength is also very good. So, and it's fully biodegradable and uh, it can be used in uh, label, label surgeries and places where the size of anger, there, there should be multiple fixation points and the size of the anger should be low. So this preserves bone stock and uh, it, it is the, the advantage is that post-operative imaging is also very easy. Next, uh, coming to different types of suture angers based on anger materials. So basically, based on the anger materials, you can divide it into non-biodegradable and uh, biodegradable. So the non-biodegradable was the initial one which was designed. That is the metal uh, suture angers, which consist of steel or titanium alloys. And uh, the biodegradable came uh, after that. So we'll be discussing each one by one. First is the metal anger. So the this was this as I told this the initial angers which was designed in 1985 and came into use in 1990 were all metal angers which are uh, made of stainless steel and titanium which are the static and uh, angers and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 they have both advantages as well as disadvantages because uh, the metal angers have basically minimal OC integration so. Uh, they don't uh, get absorbed or integrated onto the bone. The stainless steel, when you're using, they have an encapsulated fibrous layer. Whereas titanium, they induce a minimal uh, inflammatory response. So the main advantages of this is that the, the, the mechanical strength of the anger when you're using a, a metal anger is very good. So the purchase, the, the purchase onto the bone will be very good. And they are mostly self-drilling and self-tapping. So there is no need for a pre-drilling of uh, the uh, bone in uh, metal angers and in uh, older ages when there is a, a weaker bone but we can always use a longer screw type anger which gets better purchase but the disadvantage in this is when if you if at all there is a failure and we want to um, uh, revise the surgery then the new uh, new the, this anger has to be either pulled out or removed from the bone or a newer track has to be selected when you're putting a new anger 
And the other problem is that in metal angles, the modulus of elasticity of this angle will be higher, much higher than the bone. So there occurs stress shielding. You sh ideally, the modulus of elasticity of whatever implant we are using should be closer to the bone. So for metal angles, it will be higher and there will be stress shielding, which eventually results in anger loosening and fatigue failure. And uh, even though the post-operative imaging, we can identify failures in simple x-rays without the need for an MRI. We need to identify uh, uh, the uh, anger migration or any failure of the anger with the post-operative x-ray. But in case of any other imaging, there will be a post-operative distortion of the imaging, especially if you want to take a CT. And uh, the uh, metal angles have been found to migrate even after many years of uh, uh, surgery, even after seven years of labor repair. The, uh, if it's if it migrates and uh, goes into the joint, there will be significant label and uh, okay. cartilage damage. Next, so because of all these problems, the bioabsorbable angles were invented. And uh, they are polymer-based implants. So polymer means any repeating uh, chemical unit of a monomer. So the earliest po polymer bioabsorbable anger that was used was the polyglycolic acid, PGA, uh, which used to degrade within three months. Uh, and some of the designs even uh, uh, degraded, started degrading at the first week and completed by around one month. So the problem of these early onset degradations were that the, the, the there was early loss of fixation. And it, due to the degradation, it resulted in osteolysis and uh, sin glenohumeral uh, joint synovitis, loose body formation, cyst formation. So all these complications happened. So uh, newer polymers were uh, found out and the uh, currently used polymers are uh, poly-L-lactic acid, poly-L-bar-D-lactic acid and poly-lactate-co-glycolate. Uh, uh, so now we use these polymers. Combination also. So the use of uh, using these polymers in combination is that the uh, the the uh, degradation period can be adjusted even up to uh, seven months to one year, so that there will be adequate time for the fixation to uh, the, the physiologically heal, and uh, the, uh, the bone so bone uh, uh, formation happens after the degradation of the bioabsorbable angles. So again, the problem, uh, the advantage with this is in uh, non biodegradable uh, as in metal angles, I've told that if you want a, if there is a failure or there is a need for a revision, we have to drill through the, we have to drill a separate track uh, for that anger and the, this, the old anger either has to be removed or uh, kept in place. In the biodegradable one, we can mostly drill through the anger or by the time that revision is required, this will be fully absorbed also. And uh, the generation of uh, pH change, acidic medium uh, near the angles after uh, the uh, degradable angles have resulted in some inflammatory responses uh, due to the degradation products, the acidic products. That happens basically when there is uh, some space around the anger and uh, it is not uh, 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 adequately tightly fit. Then uh, these are the recent studies which show uh, metallic angers versus biodegradable angers. Uh, there was no statistical difference when it comes to uh, mean functional follow of four years. But the disadvantages, as I mentioned, was uh, in cases of failure or for revision. And uh, the uh, comparing the pullout strength, the metal suture type angers had greater pullout strength when compared to biodegradable uh, polymer angers. But it always uh, comes with the uh, side effects of uh, being a non-absorbable anger. Next, because of all these problems, poly either, either ketone was uh, devised. And these are the uh, uh, newer generation angers, which is an, it's a non-biodegradable polymer. But the, uh, the, the good thing is that it has a comparable mechanical strength and elasticity to cortical bone. And the modulus of elasticity, as I told in the metal angers, were much more when compared to bone. In peak, it is as uh, close to cortical bone as possible. So there is no stress shielding for peak or it is very minimal. And the, thus the loosening and uh, uh, other uh, the stress, the loosening or uh, implant failure for peak is very less. And it does not generate any artifacts in imaging. And uh, the other advantage is that for revision surgery in peak, although it is non-biodegradable, we can always drill through the peak anger and it is uh, the same channel can be used again for putting a new anger also. So uh, the other newer materials which, that we use are the biocomposite angers. These are not just biodegradable. They are polymers made of uh, uh, 
two types of substances. One is uh, uh, an, uh, an osteo a bioabsorbable poly polymer, which is uh, hydro hydroxyapatite, and the other one will be a bioconductive, an osteoconductive uh, polymer. So the combination of these two, how it helps is that the bioabsorbable polymer, which is the hydroxyapatite, gets reabsorbed earlier in the uh, 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 the course of uh, fixation. So within around uh, uh, one to one to two months, the bioabsorbable polymer will get absorbed. And the rest of the uh, rest of the polymer, that is the osteoconductive, that is mostly beta tricalcium phosphate, triphosphate, beta TCP, uh, that will help in osteoconduction. So that forms the calcium and phosphate substrates as uh, uh, breakdown products that help in bone formation and mineralization. So the whole track gets mineralized, and the uh, there is there will be there will be no leftover track, and the whole bone is formed. So that is the advantage of a biocomposite angle. Next, the latest. Uh, uh, type of design is the biodegradable metal implants. So it mixes both the advantages of a metal implant as well as a biodegradable implant. So what it does is uh, it uses magnesium alloys. Mainly magnesium gets reabsorbed as even, even though it's a metal, it gets reabsorbed in the body. So magnesium alloys along with zinc or iron were uh, devised and uh, uh, the good thing is that they don't exhibit stress shielding as a typical metal anger and the mechanical characteristics of this anger is similar to a metal anger. So the mechanical purchase and the pull-out strength of this anger is similar to a metal anger and can be used in osteoporotic bone also. So uh, over a period of time, this gets reabsorbed and as seen in this picture, over, over a period of uh, seven months, uh, this fully gets reabsorbed and uh, uh, bone is formed on the, uh, the suture tract. Uh, next is a uh, new technology of uh, suture anger manufacturing called the additive manufacturing. So usually we uh, make angers by milling or uh, uh, rolling or the usual mechanical processes by which a suture anger is made. Whereas in additive manufacturing, what we do is uh, it is made by 3D printing and uh, the angers are made layer by layer by adding materials layer by layer. So the, pro the use of this is that there is no particular mold from which an anger is made. We can de de devise the design in whichever way we want. And even angers of very small size can be made using additive manufacturing with these specific properties that we want. Customization is very easy with additive manufacturing. So uh, e e the angers which are to be used in uh, labral surgery or in even uh, metacarpals and metatarsals, the small joints of the uh, body can... Uh, even be made using additive manufacturing. So that happens by local melting of metallic powders of wires using laser or electron beam as a heat source. And then uh, uh, the angers are made. So the advantage, as I said, was the uh, freedom in design and complexity. The very smaller size angers can also be designed without a pre uh, the, uh, a mold and uh, customization and the uh, production of the, the porosity or the perforated structures which we make for best osteointegration integration can be designed much easily. Next, coming to anger placement. So, as we all know, the dead man theory of uh, suture anger observation was uh, made by uh, Bakar et al. in uh, 1995. So, what as shown in this picture, this is the uh, post uh, to which the, the, the tip of the, the the anger of the wire is attached to the tip of the post and the dead man stone is uh, kept uh, buried inside. So, uh, Burkhard et al. Uh, um, compared this to fixation of a rotator cuff tissue where the rotator cuff acts as the post and the suture anger acts as the dead man stone. So, he noted that uh, the, the fence, the, the, uh, the force that displaces the fence, that is the Wx, is equal by the uh, counteracting force of Tx when the angle made by the dead man anger is 45 degrees or less, that is the angle theta. So that was uh, observed and uh, using trigonometric calculations, the same was applied to rotator cuff tissues also. And, was, uh, and we noted that the angle of the anger insertion should be 45 degrees or less. But this study was again uh, disputed by Strauss et al. in 2009, where he noted in, in in vitro studies that the angle of insertion, uh, the pull-out strength of the angles were noted to improve when the angle of insertion was at 90 degrees when compared to 45 degrees. But again, uh, they were all in vitro studies and there was no uh, in vivo comparison, but there were all biomechanical studies. So 
there was a letter to the editor the reply by baka at all at the, to the same article which states that this was the intro picture given by uh, strauss et al in his article where we can see that the after the pull out of angles on the left side we can see this was inserted at 45 degrees and the right side this was inserted at 90 degrees so he was telling that after the pull out the uh, the, the the loosening of the anger is seen much more in the 45 degree implant so uh, Burkhardt replied that uh, this happens because on the left side you can see that the suture anger is inserted much more just in the stick. So uh, he was telling that this also could be a reason for the anger pulling out much easier at the 45 degree because uh, of a suboptimal fixation. It was not standardized throughout the study and a sub suboptimal fixation due to a much more uh, 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 subcortical fixation into the cancellous bone at 45 degrees was the reason. So, uh, a better anchor insertion angle would be at uh, 45 degrees. Next, uh, the uh, things to be kept by inserting the anchor. An improper direction, as I, as I told, was should be avoided. And a deep anchor insertion is not always a better fixation because it gets fixed in the sub uh, in the cancellous bone and there will be a suboptimal fixation and the pullout strength uh, may not be good enough. And even though after inserting the anger, always a good quality tissue should be present, which is not always in our hand. And the knot integrity should be at its best. That is the that is in our hands and should always be ensured. So when it comes to the common uh, surgical conditions that we use suture angers in uh, shoulder surgery, one is a rotator cuff surgery. The uh, repaired cuff can be divided into three, three sections, the tissue suture junction, the suture anger junction, and the anger bone interface. As I told, the anger bone interface, uh, using these multiple angers and fixation strengths, we can achieve if there's a good quality bone. And the suture anger junction in the, uh, in the newer model of angers, the suture anger at the eyelid, the failure is very minimal. And the tissue suture junction is where most of the failure happens. That is due to the uh, poor quality tissue. Uh, due to fat infiltration and due to uh, mul uh, there only being uh, limited points of contact. So the, the our job is to improve the outcome by doubling the number of fixation points of suture to tendon. Like a ripstop stitch, uh, you can uh, try to get uh, multiple points of fixation to the tendon and thereby the load uh, that is uh, that comes to each of the suture will be minimized and the cutout rates can be minimized and the quality of the suture, not security and the proper uh, uh, knotting technique should be used. These are the precautions to be used in rotator cuff surgery. And uh, the cortical thickness in graded tuberosity is very less and uh, the anchor point insertion is just lateral to the, uh, uh, just lateral to the uh, lateral part of the articular cartilage. And uh, in labral surgeries, yeah, the problem is that the uh, the, the, it requires multiple points of fixation and there is only a narrow glenoid part and the anterior inferior part has actually the minimal uh, uh, bone uh, uh, quantity also. So the, uh, the, these are the conditions where we can use an all suture anger which comes in much smaller sizes and uh, the, the, this study shows that uh, an all suture anger which uh, comes in even sizes of 1.4 mm uh, to 1.8 mm can be used as the, so that multiple angles can be used and multiple fixation points can be used and the pullout strength has also been found to be adequate for fixation of labrum. So the take-home message, uh, there are multiple uh, types of angles, non-biodegradable and biodegradable. So newer angles are also coming up which, uh, which are even metallic and uh, biodegradable. So uh, we can we have a multiple uh, we have multiple options of suture angles to choose from. So uh, based on the characteristics and the need of the surgery, we can choose angles. And although suture angles are used, always having a good quality tissue and having multiple points of fixation to the tissue and not integrity are uh, most important. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Govinda. That's a very nice presentation. Kindly uh, share this PPT uh, in the doctor's group. So that everyone will benefit from this uh, PPT. Uh, you, have, you have discussed everything about uh, suture angles. There's nothing uh, additional that I'm going to add. But uh, when you go out as a as an arthroscopic surgeon who wants to venture into the field of shoulder surgery, you have to be very careful because um, right now the trends have changed for the glenoid labral fixation. 
previously we were using the metal anchors and then we shifted to the biodegradable anchors and then to the peak anchors and now we have uh, fixed on to the uh, all suture anchors the main advantage is you have already mentioned uh, because of the size of the all suture anchor second thing is revisability if, uh, if at all the anchor pulls out or if at all the thread pulls out you can revise the hole because it's very small so using a metal anchor for a glenoid label fixation at present scenario is a crime so never indulge in doing that the company people will tell that the anchor costs less and it's more economical for the patients please do not do that why because in these uh, biodegradable or peak anchors or in uh, the all suture anchors you can have something called pre drilling you pre drill the cortex and then insert the anchor whereas in metal anchors there is no concept of pre drilling you have to just directly tap and then screw it in when you're trying to do that the uh, junction between the screw and the uh, the uh, handle Uh, if it's weak which is commonly seen in indian companies the anchor gets stuck in between and the anchor becomes prominent and uh, there is no way you can uh, you know you will have difficult time uh, taking the anchor out of the bone you cannot tap it in and uh, and it also in addition also creates a bigger hole so the entire process of repairing the labrum becomes um, a very tedious job so you have to be very very careful when you are trying to use metal anchors better not to use it in glenoid label fixation and the same holds good in uh, rotator cuff repair also because the uh, here also there is no pre drilling you have to do direct tapping or direct uh, screwing it in and if at all the junction between the handle and the screw is weak the uh, the uh, uh, anchor remains prominent over the cuff and uh, that will cause enormous pain for the patient i think we have seen uh, such cases uh, recently for the glenoid labrum as well as for the cuff where metal anchor was used and i'm highly uh, confident of the fact that it should be a indian um, implant because we hardly see these set of uh, uh, complications in uh, imported implants like smith and nephew or arthrex and in fact they have actually stopped i mean they're not promoting these metal anchors so uh, you have to be very cautious second thing is the quality of the fiber wire which is being provided also plays a very important role now if you compare the quality of fiber wire provided by conmed linvatech or striker or arthrex or smith and nephew it's it's very nice it's high quality material when you compare that with indian um, uh, threads uh, biotech compromised and another uh, gujarat made uh, companies it's very thin they call it a fiber wire but you can actually cut it with a scissor that should not be the way a fiber wire cannot be cut with a scissor it should be cut only with a knife so these sort of fiber wires when it is thin and when you try to repair it uh, using the rotator for a rotator cuff that itself will cut through the tissue if the tissue quality is bad and it is uh, not the right way to proceed so you have to be very careful in choosing the implants better when you are starting your practice go with the standard uh, which we follow here uh, the either uh, smith and few or arthrex and uh, better use the best implant uh, which will uh, keep you out of trouble then uh, uh, in the glenoid labral fixation the angle of fixation for uh, the anchor should be anywhere between 45 to 60 degrees and it is more uh, if it is 60 degree to, uh, degrees it is uh, very much ideal for an all suture anchor that's what the literature says and in case the anchor pulls out you can use a larger size anchor in the form of a peak 2.8 mm normally we use a 1.8 mm all suture anchor if that fails we can use a 2.8 mm anchor so that will be a bailout procedure for a labral repair which is um, where the anchor has failed in the rotator cuff uh, in addition to using the right anchor you should know the right position right place where you have to insert the anchor for that you should know which is the strongest point of the proximal humerus the strongest part of the proximal humerus is actually the biceps groove which is the most strongest part followed by the lesser tuberosity and then followed by the greater tuberosity uh, the greater tuberosity is stronger near the biceps groove area which means the anterior cable where the supraspinatus and the um, the lateral pulley inserts onto the greater tuberosity the weakest point of the greater tuberosity is the place where the infraspinatus is attached Uh, you know the places where you have the bare area so those areas are very weak and uh, rightly you have to choose what implant to place in which position so a stronger bone it's always better to use 
you can use all such rancor because you have a strong cortex and the pull out strength is quite good but if you encounter a weak bone or an osteoporotic bone never use all such rancors because it tends to fail there are two concepts which have been proposed here uh, one concept is the all such rancor works by locking onto the under surface of the cortex and uh, hence its pull out strength is good that may be true in case of a normal bone but in an osteoporotic bone the lamellar bone is reduced you don't have good bone stock and you have a thin cortex some people say because the cortex is present even if it is thin the all such rancor works well no that's not the way in case of osteoporotic bone so in osteoporotic bone always try to use a larger size anchor preferably a 6.6 mm anchor and usually um, the bio anchors do not come in that uh, size so we have to use probably a 6.6 mm uh, metal anchor which will be the ideal way to go about for an osteoporotic bone the problem here is you will not be able to identify osteoporosis pre operatively so it's all an intraoperative decision so you have to be very very careful and if at all you experience uh, an, um, you know uh, uh, an osteoporotic bone and even if that 6 mm or 6.6 mm anchor does not hold good onto the bone what is the bailout procedure now there is a condition where you have to use vented anchors vented anchors are the ones which have holes in it you know the helix uh, the helicoil which we use in smith and nephew it has got numerous holes in it and uh, you can insert the anchor take out the irrigation fluid and put cement bone cement in the hole so that will act as a firm fixation point followed by which you can repair uh, the cup so that will be the right way to deal with osteoporotic bones and uh, generally we try to avoid metal anchors in uh, our uh, setup we use it only in two cases especially in osteoporotic uh, conditions that is one or in extremely you know um, uh, uh, economical uh, scenario where you don't have uh, any option then you have to uh, cut down on the cost and that too now we have switched over to transosseous cup repairs which is a very good alternative for us so we try not to use metal anchors most of the time um the uh, uh, problem with uh, metal another problem with metal anchor is if the fiber wire quality is not good it easily cuts to the anchor eyelet and that leads to failure and next thing is you will not be in a good position to revise if at all the cuff fails because the anchor is non absorbable it occupies most of the space and then uh, you will you won't have much uh, space to uh, fix in the remaining bone uh, young people think that the more anchors that you place on the proximal humerus for cuff repair the better is the fixation that is not true please don't uh, think about uh, in that way because the proximal humerus is a very such a small bone and if you place 5.5 5.5 and uh, in uh, two medial rows and two lateral rows that itself occupies the entire uh, portion of the proximal humerus and if at all uh, a, a situation arises where you have to revise it you will not have a good bone stock second most important thing is the more number of anchors you have in the proximal humerus the more will be the patient's post operative rehabilitation pain because it acts as a of space occupying lesion within the bone and that will lead to pain so that's been proven so because of these two conditions it's better to use minimal anchors better fixation by releasing the cuff properly and it should be a tension free repair so ideally two anchors for the medial row and one anchor for the lateral row is a better option if you are preferring a double row repair and if you are getting a good cuff coverage onto the gt even a single row repair is more than enough and uh, choose wisely when you are trying to do a cuff repair and a labral repair and you should know which anchor to use thank you sham in osteoporotic bone uh, trans or she is equivalent um maybe using the tape either open or using tendon tunneler when our guys go back you know, they may not have <coughs> tendon tunneler um when you open trans osseous using a tape is it a good option so that is the best option sir it is not a good option that is the best option because uh, we we are in uh, when the if at all the use we find even the fiber tape cuts through the bone you have the open proximal humerus you can supplement it with bone cement so you have all the options available and it is very easy so if uh, 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 the problem here is we will not be able to assess the osteoporosis pre operatively it's all an intraoperative uh, finding so if we find that our anchor is failing intraoperatively and the bone uh, the anchor is uh, not holding on to the bone properly we should not hesitate to open up 
open up properly do it with the fiber trip and transverse technique because in osteoporotic bone we don't need the tensor tunnel we just need a large uh, curved needle which can take a nice bite through the uh, 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 greater tuberosity and uh, through that only we can shuttle fiber tape and fix it if at all it feels to be weak then we can supplement it with bone cement fixation sir so mini open repair is a better option in case of uh, osteoporotic bone thank you good morning everyone am i audible yes ashish so starting with today's presentation i have got uh, the hagel lesion and gagl and parallel cyst starting off with the uh, anatomy of the glenohumeral ligaments glenohumeral ligaments unlike the capsule of the shoulder joint is made of condensation of the fibroligamentous layer that is made of the capsule that has folded in on itself to form thickened fibrous bands that are present on the periphery of the joint in the anatomical location as mentioned by their names s for superior m for middle i for inferior uh, they have defined orientation uh, of the fibers and provide a stabilizing force to the joint at different anatomical positions for example inferior is in uh, uh, external rotation and abduction and inferior is further divided into anterior and posterior which is further strained on different ranges of abduction also so the igl uh, will be speaking in uh, uh, context to the hagl and the uh, gagl lesions uh, the inferior glenohumeral ligament is the most important structure when discussing both these lesions it has two bands as i just mentioned the anterior and the posterior the anterior band as can be seen in the figure in the top right arises from the 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock position and the lab of the labrum and the posterior band arises from the seven o'clock to nine o'clock position of the labrum and it has an axillary pouch in the intervening space between now um, the humeral attachments of these bands the uh, anterior band is attached distal to the less tuberosity and the posterior band is attached posteriorly distal to the greater tuberosity these lesions have been classified uh, by uh, mansfield et al uh, called the West Point classification system, depending on the position of the lesion, the anterior hagel, uh, anterior bony hagel, and the floating anterior IGHL. Floating is when the uh, hagel is combined with the detachment of the anterior inferior labrum as well. Similarly, the posterior lesions are also subdivided into uh, posterior hagel, posterior bony hagel, and then floating posterior IGHLs. The posterior bony um, uh, uh, floating uh, Hagel lesions have been further classified by Ames and Miller uh, into these four, uh, which uh, type one is basically the soft tissue avulsion in both the surfaces. For example, the uh, bank arteria soft tissue and also the humeral attachment soft tissue. Type two is where the soft tissue of the Hagel lesion is accompanied by the bony bank art. So you can see the rim of the glenoid being avulsed in type two. Type three is um, bank art is gone back to soft tissue again but the attachment, humeral attachment of the glenohumeral ligament is bony. So bony hagel plus a normal bank art. Type 4 is bony on both sides. That means bony hagel as well as a bony bank art. Coming to the epidemiology, this is a very rare lesion and many papers have been, uh, papers have been published and uh, they again and again mention the same type of patient profile. Male preponderance, active lifestyle, most commonly in the second to third decades, Athletics are the most common with high end, uh, high energy trauma being the second most common cause with a heavy load carrying being the third common cause. It is very rarely presented in isolation. 71% of the hagen lesions have some form of concomitant shoulder injury accompanying it. So most common is the anterior band of the IGHL uh, followed by the posterior band of the IGHL uh, followed by the MGHL and the SCHL lesions. Uh, focusing on the uh, hagel lesions, like I mentioned before, uh, most common cause is index trauma, which is of high energy. Uh, it can also be presented in repetitive micro trauma, especially seen in pitchers, throwers, bowlers, etc. And it has a very low prevalence, uh, as I mentioned previously. And it is even rarer if it is found in isolation because 71%, as I mentioned, has a concomitant shoulder injury. Patient will mainly present with a chronic instability, pain or poor shoulder function that he is not able to match uh, prior to trauma. It uh, In presence of uh, high, end, uh, high energy trauma, due to the multiple injuries already present in the shoulder, we might often miss it or underdiagnose this. 
uh, which is critical, which is uh, extremely crucial because even if you repair a bank card, even if you repair a cuff, even if you repair the shoulder pathology, that is the primary importance. If you leave the haggle or if you have not diagnosed the haggle, uh, the patient will come back and will inevitably need a uh, resurgery because of persistent pain and instability. So it is extremely crucial to look for it. Now, haggle is a lesion that is um, very hidden. It's not very obvious. You have to go and look for it. So when exactly do you uh, go in and search for the uh, uh, proposed haggle lesion. If there's a bank cut, a hill sack, rotator cuff injury, or if there is any absence of cause of chronic shoulder instability or pain. Also, in cases of subscapularis pathology, haggle can be there as an accompanying lesion. Presence of chronic shoulder pain or instability in a failed non-operatively or operatively managed patient should prompt Consideration uh, should be accompanied with a prompt consideration of a haggle lesion. Now, coming to the uh, best modality of imaging, MR arthrogram, especially in the T2 fat suppressed images, is the best modality. So, in acute cases, blood will act as a contrast medium, and uh, uh, in arthrogram images in chronic cases, we can use gadolinium. There is a, a pouch, like I mentioned, the axillary pouch, where in normal shoulder uh, patients, the fluid will uh, uh, accumulate in that axillary pouch. However, if there is a tear, if there is a haggle lesion, then as seen in the MRI image on the right side, you can see that there is extravasation of the contrast medium into the surrounding soft tissues. That is pathognomic, that is very, um, uh, um, and that helps in diagnosis of the haggle lesion. Of course, the gold standard would be a intra finding in the arthroscopy specimen as uh, as seen in the uh, figure here. So this is the typical J sign that you can see. That is uh, uh, the reason for the J sign is basically the extravasation of the contrast due to the tear in the haggle area. So that is uh, moving into the soft tissue under the axillary pouch. It has an extremely poor outcome with non-operative management with a high rate of recurrence of pain instability and it can uh, it's uh, there is no preponderance to healing and uh, surgical outcomes have an excellent outcome uh, have an excellent healing rate so IGHL is extremely important to ask the position of the arm while uh, injury had taken place for example inferior glenohumeral ligament is maximally stressed in abduction external rotation position. If the arm during the time of injury was only abduction, the likelihood of bank cart increases. But even then, as I mentioned previously, if even if it is just a bank cart, it is always mandatory to go in and so look for a haggle lesion. Now, uh, there are almost 7.5 to 9.3% of the cases of haggle have been diagnosed only through arthroscopy. Even in the MRI, it was very rarely picked up. And finally, when we went in with the diagnostic arthroscopy, that is when the humeral evolution of glenohumeral ligament was diagnosed. Coming to the management, it has to be noted that it is a very rare pathology and uh, not much of literature is there. And whatever literature is published mentions that it's a very challenging case because it is using portals that are not very commonly used for a normal shoulder pathology like a bank cut or a cuff repair, especially for beginners starting out uh, with their shoulder cases. Most important point from which we need to start our management is from history and examination. Very often, the history is very similar to that of a traumatic anterior-inferior instability case. Chronic complaints like poor performance, chronic pain, instability can also be present. Previous episodes of dislocation or subluxation must be particularly asked for. A history of instability at a time of previously operated bank cut or in the absence of bank cut must also uh, give rise to a suspicion of haggle. Examination-wise, uh, the apprehension test, Job's relocation test, anything that will point us towards the findings of instability, anterior inferior instability must be checked. Uh, the load and shift, etc. must be uh, checked in particular. Imaging, coming to the imaging, the normal skyograms for routine shoulder case like the true AP, the axillary and the scapula Y must be asked for. Uh, this is not to visualize the haggle, but this is to visualize an associated bony lesion that is that can be presented with a haggle lesion or if there is an associated bank card, bony bank card. 
So the gold stand, I mean, the most important would be the MR arthrogram, which is the best modality of imaging for identifying a Hagel lesion and must be done if Hagel is suspected. Uh, as you can see here on the coronal view, there is an easily picked up extravasation of the contrast fluid into the surrounding tissue instead of pulling up in the axillary pouch. So how do we manage? Should we open? Should we not open? Like I said, not many papers published due to the rarity of the case. Multiple studies conducted but no clear-cut preference of one over the other. But recent trends involved increasing popularity for the arthroscopic repair as per the recent literature. So going to the OT preparations, the anesthesia is usually regional plus minus GA. Beach chair position, but some surgeons even pr uh, prefer uh, lateral decubitus if there is an associated bank card component that needs repair. Uh, prior to starting the case, always examine under anesthesia and look for increased translation of the humeral head. The main portals that uh, come into the picture is the posterior portal, uh, posterior inferior and the anterior working portal. Now, just a very brief step-by-step uh, -step, uh, thing. Uh, first, you start off with the diagnostic scopy, go to the Hagel area, and uh, if there is, as seen in the uh, image uh, here, you establish a posterior inferior portal and you push in a 8.25 cannula, self-retaining cannula over there. So this gives you access to the Hagel attachment site. Uh, you can see that HN denotes humeral neck. That is where you want to ideally seat the anchor. And that is where you will decorticate, freshen the bed, place the anchor, and the threads that arise from the anchor, you will push and park in the anterior uh, portal. Um, once you park the threads in the anterior portal, you take the suture passer, take a good bite of the IGHL as you can see in the figure on the left side. And from the uh, suture passer, you push in the nitinol wire and that also goes into the anterior portal. Now, in the anterior portal, now you have the nitinol wire as well as the uh, sutures. So you tie one of the suture, bring it out and you'll have a configuration like you see here in the bottom right image. And you put place the knot after which you will get a reattached IGHL ligament. So extremely crucial that you have to keep in mind is do not over tighten because many, many, almost 80 to 90% of the patients who undergo a Hagel repair have a mild restriction in external rotation, possibly due to the anterior band over tightening during this procedure. So the same thing is uh, repeated for the second anchor. Ideally, you, uh, literature seems that you need two anchors for a good fixation. So again, uh, make sure that you do not over tighten either of the bands anterior or, or posterior because we don't want to limit the external or internal rotation of the patient. Rehabilitation protocol after Hagel repair is basically passive ROM for three weeks, uh, limiting to 120 degrees forward elevation, 90 degrees abduction and 30 degrees external rotation. After three weeks, up to six weeks, we can give full passive range of motion. And beginning from six weeks, we can start active and active assisted motion. Full return to activities expected by around three months. So what is the outcome in the literature that's published so far? Uh, the return to sports level is basically determined by the primary lesion. If it's a bank card, then it depends on the bank card. If there's a rotator cuff, it depends on the rotator cuff. Hagel has a supporting role only, but make sure that it has to be repaired. Return to pre-trauma activity levels after fixation is approximately 81% of the patients go back to pre-trauma level of activities. Now, uh, com some complications that do come up is, as mentioned, decreased external rotation nearly 80 to 90% when compared to the contralateral normal shoulder. There's a chance of re-dislocation of 2.6% and post-op apprehension of 3.4%. So coming to the uh, GAGL lesion, uh, glenoid version of glenohumeral ligament, this is even more rare than the Hagel lesions and an uncommon reason for a cause of anterior uh, shoulder instability. It's a rare condition that involves a labrum that remains attached to the glenoid and the IGHL complex that is detached from the labrum and the glenoid. So uh, the cause for a GAGL is an even more significant or a high energy trauma to the uh, shoulder, which can also predispose it to an axillary nerve injury. Now, this will gain importance as I mentioned, as I go through the slides. Uh, now, the GAGL lesions can also be secondary to an inferior capsular injury near the nerve location, associated commonly with a post-traumatic early adhesive capsulitis due to the excessive bleeding that is found in the shoulder, which leads to decreased range of motion. Imaging wise, uh, X-rays again the normal skygram protocol for a shoulder lesion, um, true AP axillary and scapula YB. There is a MRI and MRA, which MR arthrogram, 
which is uh, considered to be a very helpful tool in diagnosis. So gold standard, as mentioned previously, it has to be the arthroscopic diagnosis where you put in the scope and see. And uh, no matter how experienced, uh, there is always a high rate of misdiagnosis due to the rarity and uh, difficulty in identifying. Now in MRA, if you remember, I have mentioned the J sign for the Hagel lesion. Now in this case, the um, uh, extravasation of the fluid is not in this direction towards the humerus, it is towards the glenoid. So it forms a reverse J. So that is something that is um, helpful in diagnosis of a glenoid labrum, uh, separating it from a Hagel. Now, uh, these are the two images side by side, Hagel lesion showing the J sign on the top right and uh, uh, glenoid lesion, uh, glenoid evolution of glenoid mineral uh, lesion showing the reverse J on the bottom right. Now, surgical fixation again, it's the same procedure, uh, much like a uh, labral repair. Uh, so, anesthesia, regional, uh, plus minus general again, position can be beach chair or lateral equipetus. And portal placement, main viewing portal is the antero superior portal in this case. And uh, working portal is the anterior inferior and the posterior acts as the accessory portal. So just like the labrum, you find that the uh, labral attachment of the cleaner humeral ligament is detached. So just like a labral repair, what you need to do is, uh, you don't have to detach the labrum because that's fixed. Now you have to prepare the bed. You have to decorticate the bed for the cleaner humeral ligament reattachment and you have to rasp it, freshen it. And then uh, after freeing up the IGHL ligament, making sure it's a uh, fixation without tension, you can place it back with a suture anchor. So procedure, as I mentioned, is very similar to the bank card repair and all suture anchors can be used. Uh, proceed with anchor placement from inferior to superior fashion for ease of uh, the procedure. Now do not over manipulate. Like I mentioned, the nerve plays a very, very important role. Uh, because of the extremely high energy uh, impact that leads to a GAGL, there is always a possibility of axillary nerve stretch and axillary nerve injury. So it is mandatory that you have to evaluate and document the functioning of the neurovascular uh, condition of the shoulder, especially the axillary nerve, prior to the procedure due to common association with GAGL. So section 3, coming to the paralabral cyst, it's just like... Uh, the common cyst that you find anywhere else in the body and this is most commonly it is benign and does not really bother the patient it is just an incidental finding but sometimes what happens is that it passes through the intervening muscles of the shoulder cuff and goes and uh, uh, troubles the nerve surrounding the shoulder region uh, it can often be caused due to trauma or micro instability causing a rent in the labrum and it starts from there and it may spontaneously heal and the cyst will resolve, but some cases it persists and enlarges. Due to the strong presence of all round muscles in the shoulder joint, it may remain small and benign, like I just mentioned. And intervening muscle planes are common parts used to enlarge if such planes are accessible to the cyst. Posterior superior tracking between the supraspinatus and infraspinatus is noted and it enlarges and uh, this is where it starts bothering the patient, goes and proceeds into the supraglenoid notch where it can be bothersome to the suprascapular nerve, leading to compression features. So again, the epidemiology findings are the male preponderance again, third to fourth decade of life. And majority of these cases are asymptomatic and it's an incidental finding. But when it does become bothersome, the patient comes with neuropathy and then moreover, motor symptoms, weakness, uh, decreased range of motion, uh, more than the pain. If it is symptomatic, major complaints will be compression neuropathy, proprioception deficiencies, and muscle weakness. Uh, imaging as well, uh, it is uh, MRA is the most useful uh, to visualize the cyst and localize the cyst and how close it is to the neurovascular bundles. Different types of uh, cysts depends on the loculations, can be or a multilocular cyst. And uh, most importantly, what we have to notice in the MRA is the proximity towards the neurovascular uh, bundles as well as the size. If it is progressing on sequential MRA, you can see if it is progressing, if the symptoms are not coming down. So what are the different treatment modalities available to us for a paralabral cyst condition? Cyst decompression alone leaves a high chance of recurrence like every other cyst surgery as the tear or the source of the cyst is left unchanged. Now, if you accompany that with a labral repair, for example, the mouth of the cyst, if we go ahead and close it, then that alone should help resolve the cyst by itself in about two to three months. 
secondary muscle pathologies also spontaneously resolve with small bony erosions due to the cyst also resolving with cyst resolution. Now, if you combine these both pathologies, uh, the literature says that these two should be combined only in cases, I mean, um, uh, it will benefit the patient if the patient has complaints of compression neuropathy. So that is one indication where you can combine the labral repair or repair the mouth of the cyst as well as a cyst decompression or a cyst excision. Um, so uh, coming to the last section where we summarize, uh, coming to the uh, HAGL and GAGL, both these are rare entities which mimics anterior inferior instability. They are both hard to diagnose and can be easily missed. But if you miss them, uh, there is a high chance the patient will come back of in uh, with complaints of chronic pain, chronic instability, and might even have to uh, go in for a resurgery. So it is mandatory that you look for it, make sure it's not there. So imaging also, X-rays and uh, MRA uh, arthrogram has a very high role, a very important role in uh, diagnosis. Treatment, uh, surgical management is always preferred compared to conservative. Conservative has a very ch high chance of failure. Uh, scopy is preferred more than mini open, more than open, even though the literature is not very, uh, it does not put its foot down saying that we have to go in for a scopy. Uh, there is a good rate of return to pre-trauma levels, which can help uh, make the patient understand the necessi necessity for uh, surgical intervention for such a small lesion also. So coming to the paralabral cyst, uh, look for them, go after them only if the patient is symptomatic. Otherwise, most of them ought to resolve on its own. Main objective is to treat the source, close the rent or the label tear, uh, suture off the mouth of the thing and the cyst will resolve on itself. Removing the cyst and not doing anything for the mouth of the cyst is a recipe for recurrence. And cyst excision in association with a label repair is indicated in case of compression neuropathy alone. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Ashik. Uh, as far as uh, paralabral cyst is concerned, uh, I would differ from the fact that it self-resolves. No, it doesn't happen. It happens mainly because of a rent in the labrum. And as long as the negative pressure inside the joint persists, then uh, the size of the lesion is going to increase. And uh, it becomes symptomatic only when it causes uh, the suprascapular nerve uh, uh, irritation or a suprascapular neuropathy. That's why the patient uh, tends to have uh, uh, symptoms. The symptoms can occur either due to the labral tear, which is painful, or it can be due to suprascapular neuropathy, which leads to muscle wasting uh, without any trauma, without, with an intact yes. uh, supraspinatus muscle. Yes. So these are the two conditions which the patient presents with. And if that happens, uh, then uh, we have to always uh, uh, prognosticate the patient that uh, the early cyst decompression and a repair of the labrum gives them uh, early recovery. And uh, in fact, uh, the suprascapular nerve entrapment or uh, irritation itself is an arthroscopic emergency. You have to do yes. it as early as possible. Yes. So this is one condition where you have to intervene surgically as early as possible. There's no scope for aspiration, ultrasound guided aspiration, because it's going to recur because of the persistent uh, labral tear. Yes. Sir. Literature, of course, says that uh, if you repair the labral uh, rent, automatically the cyst resolves. And that is true only in cases where the suprascapular nerve is not affected. Mm -hmm. If the suprascapular nerve is affected, you may have to freshen the edges of the labrum you have to decompress the cyst. Sometimes it may be a, a unilocular cyst or it can be multiloculated cyst. We have to be extremely cautious. We have to visualize the cyst, use a shaver and decompress it properly. And then we have to repair uh, the labrum, which gives a uh, complete recovery. And this is usually a 100% successful surgery if done properly. Yes. So in uh, you have to be very careful in advising the patient when they need surgery and how early they need. For the haggle and gaggle, it is a very important thing that uh, we have to diagnose it preoperatively. And uh, you already mentioned the loss of J sign, uh, which uh, gives uh, a fair amount of uh, um, uh, view about uh, the uh, type of uh, lesion that the patient has. But it commonly occurs, um, it most commonly occurs in uh, the elderly patients. Uh, when it happens, um, the, uh, um, the, when they fall in an outstretched hand, they don't usually have um, the arm in 90 degrees of abductions. They have it in hyperabduction. When the arm goes into hyperabduction, that's where the stress is more on the humeral attachment of the glenohumeral ligament. And uh, that's the weakest point and it rips off. Uh, most commonly, it is seen in patients along with the rotator cuff tear also. Previously, it was thought that um, uh, if a patient has a rotator cuff tear, an elderly patient has a rotator cuff tear, 
along with the haggle lesion the experts were giving the opinion of just repair the cup alone the haggle will heal on its own but uh, keep in mind when that particular patient is quite active mm. which means yes. they involved in overhead activities it's always safer to repair the cuff as well as the haggle lesion don't worry about the post operative stiffness because it can be recovered with uh, a proper rehabilitation you don't want a repaired cuff failing because of the persistent haggle lesion okay so yes. it's always advisable to repair the cuff as well as the haggle lesion prognosticate about the uh, chance of a post operative stiffness which can uh, recover uh, over a period of time Uh, so i generally advise on uh, repairing all the anatomic putting back all the anatomical structures back to the original position yes. and uh, getting it right uh, fixing a haggle lesion is is a very very tough job arthroscopically why because you need to place the anchor in the right position and you need the correct set of instruments to take bites through the uh, the uh, thin flimsy inferior glenohumeral ligament and if you tend to manipulate or use a larger instrument like the express sew or the uh, the striker's champion then you're going to tear through the flimsy tissue and uh, ultimately you will end up repairing nothing so it's better to use uh, the suture passer or the uh, uh, the con- the uh, depu uh, mitex um, uh, spectrum suture passers anything of that sort to take the bite where you want and you rightly said that you're not supposed to over tighten that's very important you just need the ligament to come and fix onto the attachment that's all there's yes. no point in tightening uh, ighl because you don't want uh, capsular uh, shift you don't want want capsular implication you just want the capsule and the ligament to stick onto the uh, original insertion site yes um uh, 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 whether uh, anterior haggle or posterior haggle which one do you repair now anterior haggle if you are not able to repair it um, with or uh, arthroscopic technique don't worry about it just open up you can do a deltopectoral incision you can uh, elevate the subscapularis muscle from the lesser tuberosity and right in front of your eyes you will have the uh, 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 this thing, the uh, anterior uh, glenohumeral ligament which is a wavy structure ripped off the attachment and uh, when you hyper abduct the arm and external rotate you will have the entire inferior surface of the proximal humerus visible mm-hmm. and uh, you can uh, place anchors and fix both the aighl and uh, pighl so if you have any difficulty in doing arthroscopically don't hesitate open up do a deltopectoral approach and you can get get away with it we have done here uh, one open case a patient from delhi and uh, four cases uh, arthroscopically out of which uh, out of these five cases four cases uh, were successful and one case was a failure because the patient had um, uh, parkinson's disease and had a repetitive dislocation and now we have advised uh, because of the patient's age which is around uh, 65 above and we have advised a uh, reverse uh, shoulder for her because she does not have any muscle control and uh, mm-hmm. re-repairing it will be a failure so that's how we have to approach uh, the haggle lesions thank you thank you sir the haggle lesion is always a nightmare especially for a beginner um as uh, sham said uh, do not hesitate to do open uh repair yes sir another point is that um yeah, when you have a subscap tear also just ignore it go ahead and uh, do the repair of the subscap haggle will fall back and repair uh, okay. correct sir sir uh, this this was this this concept was thought previously 5 years ago this was a concept sir but uh, uh, yeah, right now uh, the the experts are uh, changing their opinion saying that let's put back everything in its place now by repairing the subscap uh, we 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 will be devoid of uh, space in uh, repairing the haggle so we can we, we if we repair the subscap of course the haggle will come into its place but it's not going to stay attached to the uh, humeral attachment so uh, uh, subscap tear is a blessing in disguise so that will give us enormous space for us to place the anchor for the haggle repair and don't over tighten the haggle and then put back the subscap with a single row or double row of our choice right now people are saying we have to repair both the haggle lesion as well as the subscap tear but um, uh, 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 the advantage of doing the subscap repair is it reinstates the residual tension in the haggle lesion so don't over tighten it if you are going to repair the haggle lesion okay sir thank you thank you sir. thank you sir.
गुड मॉर्निंग सर एम आई ऑडिबल सर सो माई टॉपिक इज अपलाइड एनाटमी इन टोटल नी आथ्रोप्लास्टी सो फर्स्ट इफ यू सी द मेकेनिकल एक्सेस इट इज मेकेनिकल एक्सेस ऑफ द फीमेर इट इज को लीनियर विद दैट ऑफ द मेकेनिकल एक्सेस ऑफ द लोअर एक्सट्रीमिटी and now uh, if you seeing the long axis of the anatomical axis it will form an about 6 degrees uh, valgus to the me mechanical axis and uh, in the tibia region if you see the long axis of the tibia it is collinear with the mechanical axis and the patella groove is collinear with the mechanical axis of the extremity and the perpendicular to the epicondylar axis so the mechanical femoral tibial alignment uh, what our aim is uh, we should uh, attain about 0 plus or minus uh, 3 degrees so that uh, there is no implant failure so if you see the lower extremity uh, it is having two dimensions consisting the hip knee and ankle lying in a straight line the epicondylar axis will be perpendicular to this line and if you see the joint in the medial side it is sloping downwards medially so the epicondylar axis will remain constant and it is perpendicular to the ap plane throughout the flexion and the extension so cutting the distal femoral surface Uh, at about 5 degrees of angle to the long axis of femur will place it perpendicular to the ap plane and in the tibia likewise we are going to uh, cut perpendicular to the uh, 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 per perpendicular to the long axis of the tibia that will place it in the perpendicular to the uh, ap plane in uh, tibia so in extended position if you see the joint surfaces are sloping medially approximately at 3 degrees so what we are doing here is as uh, it is sloping at 3 degrees we uh, if we get, take the cut at uh, perpendicular to the axis the uh, angle it will not form a congruent surface the joint surface so what we are doing is uh, in the femur resection we are taking about 3 degrees uh, varus to the articular surface and since we are taking uh, femur resection at 3 degree varus the tibial resection surface is also in 3 degree valgus to the articular surface and as a result the femur uh, and tibia surface resections will uh, result in uh, parallel to each other and uh, form a rectangular joint space so with the knee uh, flexed in 90 degrees if you see the resections are parallel to the epicondylar axis and perpendicular to the anti uh, ap plane so the and what and uh, talking about the anterior posterior axis it is serving as the anatomical landmark for femoral resection in flexion so how we are constructing it is we are drawing from the uh, uh, la lateral edge of the pcl and the deepest part of the patella groove so a line drawing these two points will form the in the anti ap plane will join uh, will fall, will pass through the center of the femur head and the long axis of the tibia it is also known as the white side line which is con remaining constant so seeing the stabilizers of the knee from the medial side it's mainly the tibial uh, mcl the semi membranosus ligament the oblique popliteal ligament and the posterior oblique ligament so when the knee is flexed and viewed from anteriorly you can see in the medial side it is the medial collateral fibers stabilizing the medial side and the lateral side it's the lateral collateral ligament and the popliteus tendon so posterior cruciate ligament will be a secondary to varus and valgus stabilizing structures the pes ancineus and the it band are parallel to the joint and they will not uh provide any stability in the flexed position so when viewed from the lateral uh, laterally so the lateral gastrocnemius uh, uh, structures which are stabilizing will be the lateral gastrocnemius tendon the lateral collateral ligament the lateral posterior capsule popliteus tendon and the it band here what we are seeing is when the knee is effectively flexed to 90 degrees it is the lateral gastrocnemius tendon 
the PLC, the posterior lateral corner capsule and the lateral collateral ligament and popliteal tendon. They are the structures stabilizing it. So in the IT band, uh, when I had flexed at 90 degree, they are for, uh, parallel to the joint surface. Uh, so they will, uh, under the lateral posterior capsule, they will be slack in uh, 90 degree flexed position. So viewed from the medial side in the extension, you can see the MCL is the primary medial stabilizer that is uh, right in extension. So the anterior fibers of the MCL, they will be uh, they will be slack in full extension and uh, the posterior fibers are uh, tightened in extension as a result of their position to the media, medial form of the condyle. So view from the medial side, it's already told uh, that side. Uh, now the anterior fibers of the MCL when flexed in 90 degrees, you can see that uh, anterior fibers of the MCL are going to be taut and the posterior fibers are going to be lax. Uh, also, the posterior uh, capsule is slack and is not going to be effective in the flexion. So, semi uh, same like lateral, the semi-membranosis and pes and sinus, they are parallel to the joint surface, so they will not provide for stability in flexion. So, ligaments that are attached to the femur near the epicondyles are going to guide through the uh, arc of motion and the anterior, posterior, anterior and posterior portions are going to behave differently in flexion and extension. So, coming to the pet petal facet, uh, the petal facet uh, it, uh, is wider than the, uh, the the lateral facet is wider than the medial facet. So, the petal and the patella tendon lie slightly lateral to the midline. And the medial and lateral retinacular structures are loose in extension. So, patella in uh, extended and knee flexed positions. If you see the uh, patella as we flex the knee, uh, the patella is going to stay in the patella group and it follows the, will follow the anterior posterior plane of the femur. And when that's happening, the medial and lateral retina claw is going to tighten as the knee flexes. And as the knee further flexes, it will further lead to tightening of the medial and lateral retina claw. So here, uh, correct resection of the femoral surface will be required to, so that the stable patella function through the entire arc of uh, flexion can occur. So, uh, coming to the internally rotated uh, femur, uh, internally rotated femur component in 90 degree knee flexion and on weight bearing. Here, if you see the, uh, uh, the uh, pat as the patella grew, I told it will go through the arc. The, the displacement of the patella grew from its, uh, uh, from the normal position and uh, Alignment in the midline and AP plane will cause abnormality in mechanism of uh, the patella tracking. So it is necessary. So if we place the femoral component in internal rotation, uh, median and AP plane will malalign the patella groove with the line of pull. So vorticeps mechanism will be affected and malaligning the, uh, it will lead to malalignment. So, therefore, when the femoral component is internally rotated, the quadriceps mechanism will become unstable in the group. Coming to the joints, joint line. <laughs> so, any changes in the joint line position will, uh, will change the tibiofemoral uh, center of rotation. So, if the new center, will, new center of rotation will form and uh, knee will pivot around this, new center of rotation during flexion and the isometric behavior which was present will be lost. So the precise effect on the length change of the superficial MCL depends on the direction of the joint line change. So you can see here a representation showing a new center of uh, rotation that is uh, created as the joint line uh, shift is occurring. The insertion since the superficial MCL Insertion site will be unchanged. It will pivot around the new center of rotation. 
and uh, the proximal movement of the superficial MCL, if you see, will cause progressive elongation of the superficial MCL. So, the effects of the elevated knee uh, joint line will go lead to the anterior knee pain, decreased range of motion, the patella baga, the mid, mid flexion instability, patella tendon impingement and accelerated wear. So, if you see the pathoanatomical changes in osteophytes, uh, osteoarthritis leads to uh, formation of uh, osteophytes. So, they mainly affect the articular surface and ligaments causing deformity and the they mainly constrain the deep and superficial uh, medial collateral ligament and the uh, posterior medial capsule. And also they are surrounding the PCL and interfere with the flexion and extension. So also in uh, uh, also affect the popliteal uh, recess and as a result, the restriction of flexion uh, flexibility on the uh, knee. So a few words on varus and varus knees. So, uh, in uh, varus knees, we are going to have the erosion of the medial tibial bone stock and uh, medial tibial osteophytes are formed. So it will lead to contractures of the medial side structures, as already told, the medial collateral ligament, the posterior medial capsule, the pes and sinus, and the semimembranosus. And when here this medial side is contracted, the lateral side is going to be elongated. Uh, flexion contracture may coexist, which uh, is manifested by contractures of both posterior capsule and uh, posterior cruciate ligament. So, met metaphyseal axis, sorry, metaphyseal varus, the, is the proximal center of the tibial cutting jig should, uh, it should be along the anatomical axis, as in, as in this x-ray. Uh, So this is the pagoda sign, uh, which uh, leads to advanced medial wear in the varus knee. Uh, so posterior tibial osteophytes, we usually uh, remove these posterior tibial osteophytes with a straight osteotome in the posterior surface of the tibia. So coming to valgus knees, this will uh, lead to loss of bone cartilage leading to instability can be classified as uh, symmetric and uh, or asymmetric uh, in response to the instability adaptive changes can occur so fixed valgus deformity the challenges involved will be the deficiency of the lateral bone and cartilage contracture of the lateral ligaments and stretching of the medial ligaments and contracture of the it band so, like varus, here the tight structures will include the lateral side, the lateral capsule, the lateral collateral ligament, the arcuate ligament, the popliteus tendon, and IT band, and the lateral intermuscular septum. Any asymmetric wear of the posterior condyles with excessive wear of the posterior lateral condyle. So, they have also reported external rotation deformity of the proximal tibia as a result of uh, the tight IT band. So here, if you see the intra, <coughs> in the entry point of the intramedullary alignment should be medialized to about 5 millimeters or to 10 millimeters so as to accommodate and correct the valgus curvature. So distal lateral uh, femoral condyle is going to be deficient and sclerotic. And as sclerotic, here you are going to take the resection it should be more from the medial femoral condyle and uh, little or bone more uh, little or less uh, bone resection from the lateral femoral condyle so in case of severe val uh, genu uh, valgum the lateral femoral condyle may need to be bone grafted with uh, metal augmentation this technique also helps to maintain the patella height uh, so this is an illustration of the pie crusting technique we are going to put longitudinal incisions in the posterior lateral capsule with uh, multiple uh, punctures with a small blade in the IT band. So, conclusion or the take home message of my presentation here I'm saying that the aim of the TKR is to restore the mechanical axis, the joint line, and uh, restore the petal of femoral alignment and to balance flexion and extension gaps. So, the ligaments which are 
uh, near the epicondyles are going to be effective in both flexion and extension. When they are distant from the epicondylar axis, it will be effective either in flexion or in extension. So po portions of the ligament complexes that attach anteriorly in the epicondylar axis areas stabilize primarily in flexion and the, those that posteriorly in the epicondylar axis are stabilizing in the extension. Thank you, sir. Karthik, uh, you have covered all uh, important points. Uh, so this is very important. That's what uh, in the last session, uh, I want you to emphasize uh, ligament positioning in relation to the epicondylar axis and uh, and applied aspects and how it uh, uh, we have to balance in both flexion and extension. I think you have covered uh, all the necessary things which uh, you should know prior to going for a primary total arthroplasty, Karthik. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, we will be having a few talks on uh, uh, Thursday where uh, Dr. Um, the cardiologist and the neurologist whom we have uh, visiting the consultants will uh, talk about some of the red flag signs and then how to differentiate between uh, central and uh, peripheral nervous uh, disorders and OPD care. So do attend that on uh, Thursday morning. And next uh, Tuesday, we will be having few, the, the final talks in the shoulder session and the gold medal presentation for uh, TNOACON. We'll have a rehearsal for that, so be prepared for it. And uh, once that is over, we'll be starting the elbow session for the future uh, Tuesday CME classes. Shall we end the meeting, sir? Yeah, please. please. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good, good meeting. See you, sir. No, uh, good night, Kapal. Good night. Good night. Thank you.